This is a Dude Studios production. And hey, I'm the Dude. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Hey Bartender Podcast. I am your bartender for the evening. I am the Dude, so that's what you call me. Or you can call me Anthony. I'm completely cool with that, too. This is a Saturday big show. So uh, before we get into that, I got to do my usual bartender thing. I got to tell you guys about a drink special. I was cruising around Instagram and I ran across this uh, profile called what underscore we underscore drinking. And this sounded like a pretty interesting drink. So uh, get ready to write this one down. This drink is called the Straw Blaza Mint Spritz. It combines all the flavors of strawberries, balsamic glaze, and fresh mint in a delightful carbonated refresher. Now, the ingredients go as follows for one cocktail. You take one and a half ounces of tequila. Their suggestion is Don Julio Resposado. Yeah, I'm going to ruin that. Anyway, Uh, three-quarter ounce fresh squeezed lime juice, half ounce of simple syrup, one half teaspoon balsamic glaze, 10 mint leaves, four to five sliced fresh strawberries, three ounce lime topo chico, one strawberry, one mint sprig, and a lime wheel for garnish. Now the directions on how to make this go as follows. Muddle the strawberries vigorously with the lime juice, simple syrup, tequila, and balsamic glaze in a cocktail shaker. Add the mint leaves and muddle lightly. Avoid over muddling the mint leaves. Shake the mixture with ice, double strain, and pour into a mason jar filled with ice and a lime wheel. Garnish with strawberry and a mint sprig. Insert the straw and enjoy the taste of summer. Once again, that was called the Straw Blaza Mint Spritz, cu- courtesy of What We Drinkin'. Uh, they're from Fairview, Texas. Th- uh, thank you so much for letting me steal your recipe off the off of Instagram. Whether you know it or not, you'll figure it out when I put when I post this podcast and uh, start, uh, you know, tagging you and all that stuff. looks like a pretty good drink. I'll even post a picture of it and uh, tell you guys where to find them on Instagram. It's at what underscore we underscore drinking. So go check them out. This episode of Hey Bartender Podcast, I get to talk to Rachel Gollum. Uh, Hopefully I said her last name right. I never did ask how to pronounce her last name. She is a very awesome woman with a lot of great stories of working in the service industry, starting from the very, very beginning of being like a hostess and uh, working her way all the way up to being a manager. We swap a lot of stories on good and bad times that we had in the restaurant. But she also has a Fiverr account where she likes to help people out, whether it's with uh, interviews, it whether it's with uh, just wanting to talk to somebody or getting yourself out of a potentially bad situation. You want to listen to the uh, listen to this show to find out all about that. I'll give you a link at the end of the show. You might notice a couple times that you might hear some cell phone alerts uh, during this podcast. I apologize to everybody uh, because I was uh, doing a Zoom call through my phone and I was getting messages, which doesn't normally happen. But uh, so if you hear like uh, you get an email or something like that through this podcast and you look at your phone and nothing's there, odds are it was a mistake on my part. And I apologize to you guys totally. Sorry about that. And hopefully it doesn't drive you crazy. It only happens a couple of times. So feel, sit back, relax, enjoy the interview. So let's start this off. Laura Hope in the Arc Tones, would you please help me get this started? <laughs> Hey bartender, pass me a drink. The reason that I'm here is I need time to think. Rachel, welcome to the Hey Bartender podcast. Uh, I you caught my attention on TikTok because you had all these really great restaurant uh, stories and everything. Uh, so welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. So uh, why don't you take a minute here to uh, tell all my listeners who you are. Okay. Uh, my name is Rachel. I was in the services. Well, I still technically am um, in the service industry for almost 10 years, restaurant specifically eight. I was a restaurant manager for four years. Um, and then I am married. I have a really cute six month old daughter. Um, and then I have two dogs and two cats and they're also pretty cool. And that's about it. 
<laughs> well, that's cool. You got a full house going around, uh, around there. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Are your dogs and cats uh, pretty good around your kid? Yeah. Um, my the the one now is just a puppy, so we haven't really unleashed him on the baby because he's just full of energy. Um, <laughs> but the big dog, he's a golden retriever, and he is um, he's very. It's funny because he's like all over the place. He's very high energy, and then he gets close to her, and he just like you can tell he like full on restrains himself. Like he's restraining, wag- wagging his tail too hard, and he'll just like give her kisses and run away. It's real cute. Oh, I've heard golden retrievers are really good around babies. So. Yeah, he is. He's very good around her. He's very careful, which is not like him. He thinks he's a lap dog. So. <laughs> Isn't all the uh, all the big, really big dogs that still want to be lap dogs? Um, my sister has yeah, a. They do. My sister <laughs> they had a Newfoundland uh, a Newfoundland dog that was about 180 pounds. He wanted to be a lap dog, and uh, <laughs> like, yeah, he could I'll crush your legs. Breakfast back up. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, like I told you, uh, I have no problem telling all my listeners that this was like, this is like the third false start for, uh, bringing you on the show, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, due to technical difficulties and whatnot. So, uh, anyway, so why don't we start at the beginning? Um, when did you first start in the, uh, service industry? So, um, I was just out of school. Um, I had just gotten out of high school. I had started my first year of college and um, I was working retail, but then I was also working fast food um, for a uh, fast food seafood place. And then I worked there for a while. Um, and then after a couple um, opportunities of me, like sticking my foot in other places, I waited at a local chili place for a while, tried banking out, didn't like that because it was too quiet. <laughs> I needed the, the ruckus of a restaurant. And then I ended up with my company that I was previously with. Um, and then I was there for over five years as a chef leader for one year and a manager for four. Oh, okay. Uh, you go, you put your hand in pretty much everything in the service industry almost has to offer. It seems like, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Retail and now I'm a recruiter. So it's yeah. Anything <laughs> service I've, I've probably done it. <laughs> uh, so going back to your fast food days, uh, I uh, just, gonna uh tell the audience that i've already asked you this question but uh like uh like i asked you before i mean i worked at mcdonald's i smelled like french fries for probably a couple months after i quit the job uh because i did it for about a year and a half and uh so working in a seafood restaurant had to have been just as bad yep when i smelled like shrimp and tilapia all the time <laughs> <laughs> so um the thing that uh, I want to make sure that we go back over is, uh, uh, was that a, just a summer job or was uh, that just uh, for the sake of work? Yeah. So my husband, um, at that point, he was going to basic and then he was going to go to AIT right afterwards. So he was gone for almost a full six months and I just needed something to pass the time. Um, distraction is my best coping mechanism. So I just jumped in for between 70, 80 hours of work a week between the two jobs I had. Um, and then I was there even past when he came back and I stayed until, um, the managers who all four of them were dating each other. There were two sets of couple managers and it just got super dramatic and like a soap opera. And I just had to get the heck out of there. Well, 70, 80 hours a week. I'm surprised you lasted that long. I mean, uh, 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 I go 60 hours and I'm about ready to die. <laughs> yeah, I, I was a real spring chicken at one point. If you, <laughs> if I had to work half that, well, yeah, I don't even work half that now. And I'm, I'm still tired all the time. I mean, part of that is my child, but uh, <laughs> 80 yeah. hours a week now I would fall over. <laughs> it would not uh, be great. But yeah, well, the, uh, being working in fast food and have, working with uh, – an eclectic group of people's personalities. Uh, you're not fast food. You don't worry about the customers too much when you're not working at the register out front, but, uh, the eclectic different, uh, personalities that you, that you work with in the back, a lot of crazy things, uh, happen and a lot of drama and, uh, uh, it, it just, it gets a little overwhelming after a while, doesn't it? It does, especially because the company that I was just recently at, it had upwards of um, between the two sides and all the managers, 100 employees um, at any given time, where that restaurant, 
It was, I think our staff max was like 12, including managers. So it was just, if one person was fighting with another person, everyone knew about it. Everybody knew what was going on. It oh, yeah. shifts really awkward. Couldn't be in the kitchen with them at the same time. It was just <laughs> not, not good. Well, yeah, yeah, well, that happens in any restaurant. I mean, there's a little bit of drama and it doesn't matter how many people work there. Everybody's going to know about it within a certain amount of time. And that is very true. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> It's all gossip and all that sort of thing. But uh, you moved on uh, to various different jobs now. Uh, did you, uh, after you said you worked at a uh, bank did, uh, and a couple other jobs, did you just end up just deciding, oh, I feel like going back to work at a restaurant? Um, they, so I was miserable at the bank. I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, no, it was just um, I have enough trouble now kind of sitting behind a desk, but back then I was just so all over the place. Um, and I just didn't want to be there. And then I was never focused on what I was doing. So I accidentally double deposited a night drop and it like sent this, uh, company's account into like five grand over what it was supposed to be. And oh. I was like, <laughs> yeah, so they, um, did not appreciate that. So then I was kind of on thin ice and I don't enjoy being on thin ice. So I just t- took my exit. <laughs> I was like, okay. Well, working in a bank's got to, you know, it's stressful enough because you're, you have the one thing that absolutely everybody in this world needs, wants, will do anything for. And, uh, and you're the one responsible for it. And if, you know, it's, uh, way worse than forgetting person's ranch when you serve their food. I mean, uh, you got to. Right, exactly. Yeah. And messing up money that big. And then that was the only real time that I had messed up someone's money for them to be, you know, and I get it because it's money, but I was just like, I don't, I don't know how you stare at numbers all day and not mess up something once in a while. Well, sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, uh, and then you have guys like me that walk in the bank that steal all the sugar-free lollipops that he can, but <laughs> that, uh, that's a different story. From, uh, but, uh, <laughs> so uh, eventually you did end up going back into the restaurant industry? Yeah, I served at a local chili place for a while, um, and that was, that was pretty cool. That wasn't too bad. Um, I was just looking for something um, a little more fast-paced and with a little more... Um, availability for hours it was a smaller place they closed kind of earlier and they opened later so it didn't um I just wanted something where I could be there more and get more hours and it just it, it wasn't a bad place it just wasn't the like niche kind of not niche that's what I'm looking for it just like was there was that close factor that you get in a lot of restaurants because like drummer or not you know restaurant staff becomes like your family like that's you're a little home away from home and that um particular establishment just didn't have that feel to it so yeah I'm looking elsewhere yeah i get that i've uh i've worked at restaurants before where pretty much all of us servers we you know, that's your area this is my area leave me alone yeah or well i was a bartender at this particular restaurant so everybody had to come to me eventually but uh it was uh, it, it's a real bummer when you don't really talk to anybody, don't get along with anybody, don't, uh, uh, because uh, what if you have a bad day, you need to vent to somebody and nobody, nobody's around to help bring you back up or you're not helping any bring anybody back up. Uh, that's got to suck. Yeah, it wasn't. And it's not that anybody was like outright mean or anything. They were just like, I'm here to make my money and go home, which I don't fault them for having that attitude. We all get like that sometimes, but mm. Um, I was also working there and hosting at like a little uh, pizza place slash bar and they, <laughs> they, they were not, they were the opposite. They were just like kind of hateful, which I was a punk when I was that age. So it's not like I made it easy on myself in that place, but <laughs> um, yeah, neither one just gave me that closeness that I was looking for. I love to have a work bestie and I had no work bestie. So I had to sure. go. Uh, so was it a relief to be out of the customer service when you're dealing with uh, bank people than uh, restaurant people? Yeah, because, I mean, don't get me wrong, a Karen is a Karen, but, like, when it's with your money, people are a lot more, <laughs> like, at your neck about about something not being right or if they think you've done something wrong. Right. Uh, yeah, come up a dollar short, $20 short, or something like that, That uh, especially working for a federal building, uh, that could mean... A lot of mess. You're, you're going to hear it from the very lowest customer all the way up from the top, probably. But right. 
you said it was a chili place that you moved on to now. It was what just a specialty chili or just a lunch soup. And- yeah, it's a local Ohio chili place. Um, it's out of Cincinnati and there's not very, very many of them. Um, it was a skyline. I don't care. It, the, there was nothing wrong with them. That was totally me that needed to leave, but yeah, it was skyline <laughs> chili. Um, which if you've never been to Cincy, hit up skyline, <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, it was cool, but it just wasn't what I was really looking for. Right. Yeah. Everybody in, enjoys working more in a family atmosphere, especially when it comes between, uh, the employees and it actually makes things more com- comfortable for the customers. If, uh, right. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, right. it definitely does. Cause it, when there's like a certain level of tension that comes with a staff that doesn't really get along and isn't cohesive. Um, and when you go into a place, you can feel that tension that if your server gets behind, they're not going to get any help. You can just kind of tell, especially if you've worked in the industry. Mm. So you were also working at a pizza place, uh, doing hostess working. Yeah, so it was like a, um, there were two entrances to it. One was like a bar and restaurant and it's like, it's specialty was pizza. And then the other entrance was just to go in and like order pizza. Um, but I was working on the restaurant side and hosting and doing to goes there. Um, I didn't like hosting either. I, I have to be moving a lot. Like I have to like, I have ADHD and I have to be here, there and everywhere within 15 seconds or I'm bored. (laughs) So, um, standing there rolling silverware was just not my favorite thing to do. Now let's talk about hosting for a little while, because I've never really talked to anybody about hosting when it comes to this podcast. Um, people come in, you find them, a, uh, find them a seat and you pretty much just sit them down, tell them that their uh, server will be with them shortly. Now you hear stories all the time about servers saying, how come you didn't see anybody in my section? You're not seating anybody in my, uh, in this section. How come you're giving all the business to them? How come I'm not getting any business? There had to have been a lot of drama with that. Uh, there, w- there was, and these, um, they, that serving group had all been there for a very long time. They didn't have their servers didn't have a super high turnover rate, but their hosts did, and it was, um, like I said, I was a punk, so I didn't make it easier on myself. And if somebody was rude to me, like I was rude back because I hadn't kind of gauged those social skills yet of like <laughs> you know learning to shut up when I need to shut up. <laughs> but um, I'm 44 now. Just, I still haven't figured that out. <laughs> know if i ever will (laughs) but yeah they do they get mean they look because they they don't ask the next question they just assume that if you're not seating someone in their section it's like personal and it's not personal they wanted to be sat by the window like Mm. i'm not going to be like no i'm sorry the server's going to rip my head off if i seat you there i'm going to seat you over here that conversation doesn't work Mm. and they a lot of servers don't get that um Honestly, if you're going to serve, I think you should have to host for a little while just so you kind of even like just for a week, just so you get where the host is coming from. Because I've in every building I've worked in, the servers are like that towards the hosts. Like they'll be the most wonderful personality friendly server, like on and off the floor. And then they get to a host and it's like the, all the demons come out. And they're <laughs> like, why did, do they just go off? And it's like ask the question and then rip the head off if it, if it, the situation fits, but mm. then they, they don't ask. They just jump to it. Well, um, I, I've had people on my, on this podcast mention, well, nothing against their host or hostesses. Uh, we never really talked about that, but in Ohio, uh, when it comes to the restaurants that you've worked at solely, I'm not going to go off about any other restaurants or corporate or anything like that, whether you were working for a corporate restaurant or not, doesn't matter. But uh, a lot of servers have to be very careful uh, about how much money they make because of the tip out policy. Did your, uh, did your restaurant have that? So the one that I ended up being at for a long time did not, but the, the bar and pizza place did, they had to tip out the host. They even had to tip out the cooks. They had to tip out everyone on the staff. And I think that's, I think that's a cause for a lot of tension is it, it affects your money. If you do you still have to tip people out regardless, but if you're not getting sat, you're not making any money to tip them out. And then we did have servers who would have to like leave and go to the ATM because they got stiffed on a couple of high bills. And then at that point, it doesn't matter if you got stiffed or not, your sales are the percentage of which the tips come from. So mm-hmm. you have to tip out your host regardless if you get stiffed. Um, so I think that is definitely a cause for tension. Um, now, but yeah, we did have to do that there. Now stories like that scared the crap out of me uh, because uh, bar- bartenders, servers, people in the service industry, they don't make a lot of money as it is. 
and right. uh, to have to go to an ATM and uh, uh, to be able to pay, uh, uh, to, that basically going into the negative in order to tip out the rest of the restaurant, that has to be really tough on the server. Yeah, and that's that's one thing I'll say um, about the company that I ended up with for a long time is they didn't do that because at that point, the restaurant is making their employees pay their other employees, and I just don't think that, that is a good policy to have because those are your employees. You need to pay them. It's That's not like pay them an hourly wage, and then it is what it is, which is what we did at the company I ended up at, but it's not fair to and whatever life's not fair, but it isn't fair to go and have to pull money out of your own pocket to pay employees that you didn't hire. Right. Or you know, people, even people you don't even like. <laughs> right. Uh, exactly. Or people that aren't doing the work because if, if I'm a host just standing there rolling silverware for two hours, nothing against hosts because I know that more, more goes into that job, but there were days where I was just rolling silverware all day long. That doesn't, that doesn't equate to me getting 10% of a server's tips or 5% of a server's tips. They're running around with like a chicken with their head cut off to make sure that guest pay, like gives them money to begin with. So why should they have to cut me in when I'm literally rolling silverware? Right. I should be paid an hourly wage at that point. Right. I agree with you. Uh, uh, the closest I can come to that was when I was uh, a dishwasher at a corporate restaurant that doesn't exist anymore, but they, uh, uh, the servers tip me out, but every once in a while the bartender a certain bartender would say, sorry, I didn't make that much money tonight. And I'd be like, whatever. Uh, and just give me my, give me my uh, free shifter root beer and I'll be on my way. Cause I had school the next morning, but uh, uh, it, the whole idea that they were tipping me out. Uh, some of them didn't tip me out because I was a, a rotten uh, dishwasher. I only washed the dishes that made it down to where I was at. And I never walked up to get the <laughs> bus tubs. I never did anything. Uh, uh, so most of them at, you know, hindsight being 2020, I don't blame them now for not tipping me out. In fact, most of the time I didn't even expect it, but, uh, yeah, everybody's like, you want to make more tips? Come up, come up, get the bus tubs and, uh, you know, put, uh, stack dishes, do this. Um, and I was intimidated by the enormous pile of dishes and trying to keep up with that. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. And if you pull one dish wrong, the whole pile goes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, for I, I've often been curious about uh, the hostess job or host, with, uh, however, maybe just because you said, like you said, you were uh, rolling silverware most of the day and uh, you're seating people, but they, uh, you actually felt like they didn't need to tip you out. It seems like. Yeah, because I was, I was paid, like I was paid decent. I was paid 10 bucks an hour to host and that was in like 2000 and. 15 or 16. So, I mean, not that it's changed that much, but it has, you know what I mean? $10 an hour was pretty decent for hosting back then. Yeah. And then they tipped me out. And at the end of the, if, after them tipping me out, every server that worked plus the bartender, I was making more than they were at that point. Cause I was getting hourly wage plus all their tips and I didn't have to claim their tips. I just cashed out and went. Mm. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's got to, I, I just feel sorry for the servers that had to go into their own bank accounts in order to get, uh, to pay out the, uh, pay out everybody else, basically take their own money to pay out everybody when it should have been the responsibility of the company or the manager or the owner to really yeah. take care of that sort of thing. Yeah. And there were only two locations for that place. So there, there was like no HR they could call or anything like that. So it was, it was a little skeevy. There were a couple of times I just, I told the manager that that person had already paid me out because I wasn't going to be the person they went to the ATM for. Mm. Oh, that's very generous of you. Now, since you are the first person and the last person, typically, that uh, the customer sees when they come in and out of the restaurant, uh, how many customer, uh, how many customer interactions did you have other than seating them and telling them goodbye? I mean, uh, did they walk up to you tell tell you about great service, or did they want to complain to you about something, or just because they assume yeah. you were a manager? Um. Not so much assumed I was a manager. If there was a wait, obviously, I always got the, the blunt end of there being a wait. Um, I did get people that would come up and tell me how great the server was and stuff like that, and I would always make sure I passed it along, or they'd come get me if they wanted to talk to a manager. Um, the host there also, on busy days, like 
that weren't weekends where there wasn't a bus or staff, they du- they doubled as the busers too. So we would pre-bus and stuff. So I had some interactions with them then. Um, but yeah, just usually the beginning and the end of when they came in. Um, so that was mostly the extent of it, unless somebody had great or terrible service, then I would be the one to go fetch a manager. Mm. I practically talk about this movie almost every podcast, but the movie Waiting with Ryan Reynolds, Anna Ferris. Have you seen it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, that... That movie, I, 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 every time I say that, uh, maybe it's I'm trying to um, uh, publicize this podcast so I can get Ryan Reynolds or Anna Ferris or one of those Justin Long on my show. <laughs> but uh, besides that, but that seemed like to be the most accurate depiction of working in a restaurant that I've ever seen on in movies. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. But uh, the whole thing where that, like that one guy that tipped 50 cents on a, uh, like a uh, fifty dollar tab, and thought he was doing Justin Long's character a favor. The guy started complaining right in front of the hostess, saying, "I want a T-shirt. I want. I want a free Sunday and all that stuff." Do you, uh, the Karens or what's what's the male male equivalent? The Chads, I think they call them. Yeah, I think it's Chad. Or or is it Brian? Uh, uh, anyway, uh, but uh, it's like a. I think it's like an old Dane Cook joke. Anyway, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, when you have to deal with that sort of thing and you do you go running for a manager and basically grab him by the shirt and say, deal with this, I don't want to. So back then, I definitely did. I, um, yeah, that because that was the, I mean, the serving at the Chili Place, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for confrontation. It was, it's um, an open floor plan. So like, if they wanted a manager, they would just hail one down. But in this place, um, especially in the evening because they'd get liquored up, they'd be ready to go. And then they would get real hostile. And back then I was just like, no, somebody else has to deal with this. This is above my pay grade. Um, the company I worked at later, I was taking the reins on everything. Um, but no, there I was, I was passing the buck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I could pass the buck that, uh, that would have been easier. But when I was a bartender, basically when the owner or the manager wasn't there, the bartender was in charge. And so you get those customers. I want to speak to the manager, and I, hi, <laughs> and that's a great feeling though when they say they want to speak to the manager, and you're just like, hello, <laughs> how can I help you? <laughs> so you've been through that. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, it just happened to be the bartender uh, was left in charge majority of the time, and so I had to deal with the customer complaints or. Uh, questions and stuff like that. And some of them I did, uh, did good. Most of them I did poorly just because I'm too much of a smart ass, but, uh, (laughs) (laughs) but my customers eventually got used to it that they, they were like, Oh, that's just, that's just him. (laughs) And, you know, yeah, they learned to expect it from me. If they didn't hear a smart ass remark from me, they thought something was wrong, but, (laughs) (laughs) but moving on from, uh, hostessing, you, uh, you waited tables for a while. I did um, at the Chili Place. It wasn't very long. It was just a couple months. And it, like I said, it wasn't a bad gig. Um, I made decent money. It was just I was looking for something that was just a little more fun. It wasn't necessarily not fun. I was just looking for something that I enjoyed more because it was very like clock in, do your stuff, leave. Um, everybody was just there to make their money and go. And I just wanted something with a little more um, of a like a team player, family oriented atmosphere. Mm. So did you end up working for a corporate restaurant or? Yeah, the company I was at for five years um, is a very corporate restaurant. Um, I call it Biscuit Box on my TikTok. It's a restaurant with a store attached. I'll let everybody (laughs) do the math. Um, There's 750 locations now. um, So it's a pretty big, pretty big chain. Now a store attached to what, souvenirs and stuff like that or? Yeah, big gift shop. Oh, okay. That has gotten increasingly bigger over the years. But just odd knickknacks or uh, just? Um, It used to be just odd knickknacks, and now it's like everything. It's clothes, it's food, it's uh, a bunch of candy, it's home decor, kids' clothes, a massive set of kids' toys, um, books, Yankee candles, all kinds of stuff. Is that that mostly for the benefit of the people that have to wait for a table or wait for that pager to go off or whatever, however you did it? (laughs) Uh, yeah. So that's where you make your money. But now a lot of those store, like the one that I ended up being at towards the end of me being there, that store averaged close to a million dollars in just the gift shop a year. Oh, wow. 
yeah so it was it was crazy but yeah that's where you that's where you really get people um is when they're waiting for a table or on their way out they've always got to stop and look and that uh particular chain uh, attracts a lot of um like elderly customers and it's got like a bunch of cute clothes for cute little old ladies um and they get they get suckered in looking around and then before you know it they have a full basket of stuff so oh okay I was I I really can't picture myself needing to go shop at a gift shop after having food. I mean, maybe in more humorous circumstances like that big bowl of chili. We're gonna need a scented candle before we go home. <laughs> yeah, no, you would joke that, that that walking around the store was your exercise after all the calories you would take in. So that's how we do it. that's one way we used to get them sucked in. <laughs> well, uh, that's kind of cool. So uh, you waited uh, waited tables there for a little while. There, I just did to goes, and I did. Um, I I worked in the store, um, and then I eventually worked my way up to being a shift lead, um, and then a manager. For now, ended up managing three different locations throughout the five years I was there. Now, working to goes is that what like working in the uh, to go window at uh, fast food restaurant, or was it? Uh... Um, it's just like taking carry out orders and um, putting them together, and then getting them up front or out to the car or however they decided to pick them up. Oh, okay. But it was just because um, when I first started there, that wasn't its own position. So I was just working in the store um, because the servers would do it. And then they realized that the the ticket times for to-go orders were forever long because servers made their money on their tables. They didn't make money doing cater or to-go orders. So yeah. that was the last priority for a server. So they implemented that own position. So I ended up taking that on too. Well, that actually sounds smarter because I I had somebody else on this podcast a while back. She said that uh, uh, handling the to-go orders uh, during COVID, uh, uh, because she worked for a corporate uh, corporate restaurant, and the to-go orders, you made no money doing that. It was just basically stand there, get together, throw it out the uh, throw it out the door, and yeah, it really during COVID catering or or to-go orders were really rough um, because. At that point, I was a manager, and there was no staff, so it was just managers working. So at that point, there were usually four or five of us working. Um, you, were, you were – one of us was cooking, one of us was dishing, one of us was up front making sure, like, the registers were being run, trying to get people to shop because we could keep the store open because we technically sold grocery items. So when all the other retailers closed, we didn't. Um, so someone had to be up front the whole time, and then we were getting – four, five, six thousand dollars in to go orders every day, even with the shutdown. So right. but there's only managers. Uh, did uh did you uh is that restaurant back open now? Or back yes. to full staff? Um no <laughs> not to full staff. Um that that company has always had issues with staffing. Um that the last time I, I talked to my former coworker, it was still a mess. Um the area it's in is like right outside a major city. So they have a, a pretty high turnover rate, not to mention a couple of the managers who um, are on their way out or recently left weren't great for the turnover rate either. So, um, and like, not to sound like that, but when I left some of my staff turned over too. Mm. So their turnover was a little rough, but. What's going on uh, with COVID in your area right now? I've been reading a lot of states have find, uh, decided, okay, nobody needs to wear a mask anymore. What's going on in Ohio, you said? Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, everything's at full capacity that I've seen. Um, they're, they're asking that if you're not vaccinated, you wear a mask, but they're not really enforcing it anymore. No one's standing at a door making you wear a mask. No one's hanging them out anymore. Unless um, they're, they're some... Kind of- 40 year old woman with a cell phone out uh, yelling at you wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We get plenty of those, um, but yeah, it's um, yeah. They're using the honor system for the vaccine and they're all saying, if you have the vaccine, you don't have to wear a mask, but we know how the honor system works with that. So basically no one's wearing a mask. We're going to give Rachel a little bit of a break just to talk about today's show sponsor. Some of us people out here take our body grooming a little bit more seriously than others. But unfortunately, due due to circumstances of location, we have the opportunity of actually hurting ourselves and making a huge mess. That's where the Turf Chopper 3.0 comes in. On SmoothMyBalls.com, the Turf Chopper 3.0 is an electric trimmer that is next-level grooming for your average man. Traditional razors, they just... 
uh, suck and they would uh, you have potentially of really causing some serious damage to yourself that you really don't want. And plus, if you think, oh, I'll just use my, my razor that I use on my face. Do you really want to use something that's been down in your crotch on your face also? The Turf Chopper 3.0 is battery powered. It is water resistant and has a premium alloy blade. Precision engineered to give you the full sense of confidence when trimming down below the waist. Featuring a diamond no-slip grip and a fast charge battery mechanism. And don't worry, ladies, you can use it too. It's not just solely for men. But if you want to go pick up yourself one, go to www.smoothmyballs.com slash heybartenderpodcast. Remember to use the checkout code heybartenderpodcast and get 15% off your entire order. That's right, 15% off just by using promo code hey bartender podcast at www.smoothmyballs.com slash hey bartender podcast now let's get back to our interview with rachel gollum well during the uh the whole pandemic you were pregnant the whole time if i do the math right right yeah i um so i if we do the math i got pregnant right around the time that we shut down Uh uh-huh so because I, my husband and I decided we were going to have a baby and then, you know, and then, and then a week later we shut down. Well, I was already pregnant at that point. So <laughs> it was just, yeah. So I was pregnant, um, the entire, the entire shutdown. Um, and then I had my daughter at the end of December. So, uh, well that had to have been a little bit stressful on you. Did you, uh, did you take extra precautions or, uh, being pregnant because I've, I've been around pregnant women before and I know how protective they can be while the baby's still uh, sitting there in their uh, stomach. But yeah, so I, um, obviously there were a lot of cleaning um, mandates that happened with corporate restaurants. You had to meet certain cleaning standards after COVID. Obviously you want to have a clean environment for guests and stuff and people, especially right after reopen if they saw a dirty restaurant if they saw a dirty bathroom they're like i'm not coming back here this is the covid cesspool i'm out but um they wanted they weren't as understanding as i would have liked them to be with the fact that i was pregnant um i the first 12 weeks of my pregnancy i lost 40 pounds because of how often i was getting sick oh, and wow. they i didn't not that i i called off one time in four years. So it's not like I ever really called off, um, but they weren't very lenient. I was still being expected to work 12 hour shifts, five days a week. Um, they wanted me to clean with um, a bunch of chemicals that me, neither me nor my doctor were really okay with me using. Yeah. So I, I didn't. I saw that TikTok, and I was a little uh, disturbed by that story. You were, you were saying that you're very pregnant in, they had you on the floor with sanitizers and stuff like the, uh, on like that. And I said, that can't be right. <laughs> no. So, and that started right after I found out I was, um, found out I was pregnant is when all that cleaning stuff really started. And I was like, look, I, look, I can't, I'm not going to scrub the floor with oven cleaner. That's not going to happen. Mm. So they were getting very upset with me because my store wasn't getting clean to the standard that they needed it to because I was refusing to do that. So that was um, an interesting dynamic we had for a while. Um, they didn't really, I think at one point they threatened to write up and I was just like, eh, write me up then. <laughs> Knock yourself fine. out. But, <laughs> yeah. But I just wasn't, and with the throwing, cause I was throwing up all day, every day. Um, and at that point I was driving an hour each way to work. So I was already sick, six times by the time I got there. And then I was sick all day. I was like, Anytime I could get on the floor to clean, I had a trash can next to me for cleaning stuff and then a trash can next to me to get sick in. So it mm -hmm. just wasn't moving at a quick enough pace for them. And they're like, why isn't your store clean? Do the math, friend. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, was, it wasn't it was a great situation. And that that kind of started the, the ball rolling of why I ended up leaving, for sure. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't blame you for that. That's, uh, that's ridiculous because... I've worked uh, during my time in the service industry. I worked with plenty of pregnant girls, and uh, as if there's any other kind of pregnancy, anyway. But uh, <laughs> I used to watch over them pretty closely. I mean, not that they really needed my help or anything like that, but I made sure that they went and sat down every once in a while, uh, or uh, it would probably be uh, decided as inappropriate nowadays because this was back in two thousand. Or 2005 or something like that 
and nowadays it would probably be deemed as inappropriate, but I'd see them leaning on, uh, leaning on my bar, leaning on the table or something like that. And I'd walk over, massage their shoulders. And they're like, Oh, thank you. And, uh, I said, well, if you like that, and then I, I go for their lower back and then they start making this face and the customers like, what are you doing to her? <laughs> but I'm, I'm just, you know, hands, hands, but, but, uh, you know, I used to try to take care of them as much as, uh, much as I could, but it didn't sound like that you were getting much of that from your place. Well, I wasn't getting it from corporate and from the people above me, the other managers I my ha- I had in my building, they were, um, all except for for one um and i've mentioned him on my tiktok before because he was he, he would drink on the job all the time but um two of them in particular one was the gm and him and i were on the same like level professionally and then i had another associate manager and him and i are our best friends like we talk all the time we go to old employees graduation parties and stuff um but i still talk to them all the time but they always took good care of me they made sure i was eating they if i couldn't get a break they were kicking me off of whatever i was doing to make sure i got a break um making sure that i was drinking enough water Mm. if my pregnancy hormones were flying off the handle and i was going to chop an employee's head off they were making sure to pull me in the office and kind of talk me off the ledge they were really um they were really good. They made they definitely helped make up for what I wasn't getting from our higher ups, and they did take really good care of me. Mm. Oh, that's good. That's better to yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I definitely had them. It was just it, once, but um, when our higher ups came in, that it was just that was never great for any of us. So, okay, now for the transition between being wait staff into management, uh, most of us. Uh, uh, I used to talk with my fr- fellow bartenders or fellow servers all the time that, and we'd all sit back and say, I don't want the management position because I make more money walking the floor. Did you have any dilemma with, uh, when they offered you a management management position? So, no. So at that point I was hourly, um, I, cause to go was hourly. And then I was still working in the store, which was also hourly. Um, and I just, I've always kind of had like a, a thing that I like just wanted to lead the room. Like I, if, if I don't like how something is like, I want to fix it. And a lot of the things that I wanted to fix, I couldn't fix because I wasn't in charge and I didn't have the authority to like try and get things fixed. So I, I definitely wanted that position, the money, especially the first store I took, the money wasn't really a big deal to me. I think I was making like 14 bucks an hour driving an hour and a half each way, but I was so happy at that job. I like my staff was just chef's kiss. Like Uh, (laughs) they were just great. I had a shift leader and she was, she was not a shift leader when I got there. Um, And then a few weeks later, she's just like ready to go. She, they had had a lot of bad management in that store. Um, People who just like sat on their butt all day and didn't really care about them. Um, And that was always my thing is I try to be an empathetic manager. I don't like, like you have to, to rule with a certain sternness for lack of a better phrase, but I, I care about what's going on outside of, of work. I care about, you know, their aunt died. Are you okay? Like, what can I do to make it easier for you on your work life? Like their work-life balance mattered to me a lot and getting their vacations, their time off, that all mattered to me. So they weren't used to that when I got there and they were very hostile but after like a month or so, they kind of figured me out that I wasn't like that. And then we all just clicked and the, they still call me for reference letters and stuff. They all came to my baby shower. Like I was, that was probably the happiest, happiest I've ever been in a job. And I was driving three total hours a day and making 14 bucks an hour, but it was, it was just so satisfying to do. Well, you finally got the family atmosphere that you were looking for. It sounds like. Yeah, it was almost to the point of being a cult. Like <laughs> people would joke about, like you can't mess with anyone on her staff because they're she's just a nightmare about it. Which was which was the truth. <laughs> you couldn't mess with any of them, but it was it was just so satisfying. They were a great. It was all all girls. It was a great group of girls. They were mm-hmm. awesome. Now, um, now being a manager, you have a lot of stories on TikTok of management nightmares or uh, things like that. Now you had to deal with the rough customers, the uh, probably majority of the time, angry customers. And you already seem though, just the way you're talking with me for the last, uh, uh, for as long as we've been talking, uh, you already seem tough as nails. So uh, how, 
uh, how did conversations with customers usually end up? I mean, you, uh, you've told stories about customers getting sick in your bathroom. You've told stories about Karen's, uh, you know, how, how were you able to develop a thick skin over that? So, um, due to, due to early life circumstances, I've already always had a pretty thick skin. Um, when I didn't have authority, it definitely got thinner. Um, but once I got authority, like I was, it never, it never turned into like a, I'm a queen of the castle mentality towards my staff, but everybody gets one. That's the mantra I live by. So you can be rude once fine. We've all had bad days, but then if I'm still being polite to you and you're still being a jerk, then it's over. (laughs) So I will just as professionally as I can tell you to screw off. Um, and I, that's just, cause here's the thing. What part of the reason I wanted to become a manager was because I got so tired of enforcing rules that I wasn't backed on. I would be told, this is the policy. This is the policy. This is the policy. And then I would tell that to a customer and the customer would be pissed and fly off the handle at me. So I'd get a manager and the manager would be like, Oh no, we'll do it for you this time. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. you just make me look like an idiot. And I, I hated that. It was one of my least favorite things about being a, an employee. So I just made sure that that didn't happen to my staff. Um, so I, I always tried to think a bit of when it was an employee getting me involved versus a, a Karen coming up to me. I always tried to make, put myself in their shoes first. Like, okay, but if I backtrack and give this customer what they want, am I going to make my staff member look like an idiot? And then if that was the case and they're just being rude to everybody, then it's a no dice. But um, when people would just come up to me, it, it all depends on your approach. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, cause I, yesterday, for an example, I did a target pickup and they forgot my diapers. And on the way there, I was mad. <laughs> I was so mad. And then I got in there and I was like, nope, you catch more flies with honey. And then I was super nice and got my diapers and went on my way. But that's the thing you have to kind of realize when you catch yourself in that moment of, of being mad in a restaurant or wherever, it's not an emotional thing. And that's what a lot of guests don't get. They, they think it's like a personal thing that you forgot their ranch or that the to go box took two minutes too long or something like that. So then they get emotional. And once somebody reaches that point of like, I know that they're not going to emotionally back down, then I'm just going to be stern and just tell you to go on your way. Cause at that point there's no talking them off the ledge because they're already overloaded. Right. Uh, yeah, I've worked with many a manager, uh, one manager that was extremely afraid of conflict when it came to the customers. He he hid in the office majority of the time, but there were times where he came out of the office and he actually got mad at me for suggesting to a customer that to have, uh, well, he want, the customer wanted a hamburger. And I said, well, we happen to have it on special uh, on special today. And he actually yelled at me in front of the customer. Don't tell him that he was going to buy a burger for full price. And you tell him that we have it on special. And I was like, right in front of the customer. Really? And, uh, see, and I've never liked that either because now I, I won't act like I'm perfect. There have been a couple occasions, especially at that last store I was at. Cause it was just, Oh man, that store was rough, but there, if you can't, that's not good management and it's not good customer service because yeah, you want to make money. That's the point of being in a business, but you want people to come back. And if that customer left and realized that you charged him full price when he could have got it on special, he's not going to come back. Mm -hmm. And then it just, it completely diminishes you as a person when you get humiliated and like yelled at in front of a customer like that for doing your job by someone who's supposed to be an authority figure to you. It's, (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I just don't like that. It's, uh, it's, it's always really grinded my gears. Oh yeah. Me, uh, me too. Uh, there were a couple times where I purposely embarrassed him in front of a customer too, just because just to get back at him. But <laughs> we love petty. We love to see it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Why not? <laughs> but I did have a manager that would back me up a hundred percent on any kind of decision I made as long as it, within reason, of course, like, uh, uh, two guys got in a fight over a pool table and I 86 them both. My server thought I should only 86 one guy, but I said, no, they both got in a fight over the pool table. They're both gone. And I don't care who started it. What happened? They're, uh, they're done. And so she went running to my, uh, the manager about it, thinking that she had seniority and she should have made the decision. And he's like, no, it was Anthony's bar that night. He made the decision. 
uh, that's that's the rule around here. And so I was like, oh, cool. Manager that actually backs me up. This is neat. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I had um, both the, those stores that I worked at. I had incredible general managers that because in, in that store, you know, those positions are side by side. And I had incredible general managers that just backed me up 100 percent of the time, um, mostly because they knew I, I think it was a lot because they knew I was just a firecracker and they didn't want to deal with my mouth. Um <laughs> <laughs> But like, we were really good friends. Like we went on a work trip this one time and it was so funny. The, the GM that I had at that first store that I, I loved being at, um, the year that, cause they go on a work trip to Orlando every other year. Oh, cool. And it's so funny cause we don't come from the same background at all. And he's like 40 years older than me. Oh my, if he ever hears this and that's way too high, then I, I apologize, Dave, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but he's like 40 years older than me and we just got along so well like we we booked our flight on this like to sit by each other on the flight like I was always taking pictures of him in the weirdest hats like we just got along so well <laughs> and for somebody for two people who had two completely different dynamics and he backed me up a hundred percent he was my biggest supporter in that building and then the second building the GM was the exact same way um we were we were closer in age. Um, we were closer in age than anybody else, any of the other managers, because all the other managers were like, I think about 20 years older than him. So they're about 30 years older than me. Um, but him, him and I just clicked. If we needed a vent, that's who we went to. Um, and he just, he always had my back. Mm. Um, it, it's just good. It's a good feeling because you know that if everything goes to crap at work that day, it's nice to know that you have that backup behind you that's going to back you up and support you. Well, sure. You know, nothing worse than dreading uh, what's going to happen the next morning after a decision you thought was right. You know, so what's the boss going to say about it the next morning? And, right. But because uh, uh, I actually pulled a pulled a, uh, an altered ID, not a fake ID uh, from a girl that was trying to buy alcohol from me. I uh, gave it to my boss and she, uh, the rule in Oregon was uh, you have to confiscate it and turn it into the authorities or the DMV or whatever. Uh, the girl came back the next day and uh, said, can I get my ID back? And she, she goes, Oh sure. Sorry about that. But you apologized for her having a fake ID. And oh, God. Uh, I, and I was like, you, you're not supposed to give them back in, <laughs> Well, the girl said she had to get on an airplane. Oh, sure. Get on an airplane with an altered federal ID. That'll be good. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. That'll work. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it sounded like your management experiences were actually really positive for the most part. Uh, one TikTok that, because I had to refresh my memory because I've been uh, followed your TikToks uh, for a little while before I contacted you to be on the show. And I thought your management stories were uh, just awesome. Thank you. I totally side with you about uh, swearing, you know, uh, uh, that one person that decided to get on your case about swearing in front of your child. (laughs) Yeah, um, she's six months old. And, like, the thing is, is when I was a kid, I was not allowed to cuss. So, naturally, I cussed way more. And it was just not around my parents. And I would use it in times and places that I shouldn't have used it. And do I want my three- or four-year-old running around screaming the F word? No. No. But, like... (laughs) she has to understand that it's, it's, it's personal preference. Like you, if I enjoy the F word, I think it's fun. It adds character to a sentence, (laughs) (laughs) but like, would her grandmother, my husband's mom enjoy her saying the F word in front of her? Absolutely not. So it's just, it's teaching time and place. Right. Um, and that's, that goes for everything. Yeah. I don't see some of the people that come in my TikTok. Like I love my followers, but they just pick out the weirdest things to be mad about. Like, (laughs) <laughs> okay <laughs> i guess be mad about me cussing in front of a six month old that's fine well that used to be part of my shtick when i was bartending because i would quote uh comedians constantly uh whether it was robin williams george carlin bill cosby foxworthy ingvall all those guys even though yeah cosby's not really politically correct right now but i i he had he was a good comedian i'm just gonna say it but um but uh, when it came to George Carlin, uh, I, I would always recite the seven dirty words you can't say on TV. You don't go, ship his, ship his fuck, hunk, cocksucker, motherfucker, and tits. And then my customers, what the hell? And I'm like, <laughs> what, are you, what are you complaining about? You, uh, you said it on your way in? He goes, not all at once. <laughs> 
it's just fun. Like I don't, I don't, one, I don't even think about it. Like I think about it when I'm talking to people that I'm not sure how comfortable they are with it. But if I'm just like home, like that's, I say, I use, I use the word fuck more than I use like prepositions. Like and and the have nothing on the F word. <laughs> it's just part of my vernacular. Like it is what it is. Yeah. You can swear on this podcast. Of, uh, I put up. Okay. So, <laughs> so you... I didn't want to just like let it fly if it wasn't okay. So I was trying to, to gauge the conversation, but uh, I think you I mentioned sp- listening to, you mentioned listening to old Robin Williams. So yeah. I, <laughs> I think I spotted you a couple of times censoring yourself. So <laughs> Yes, I had to, uh, yeah, just a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but, you know, all of a sudden you're not, now this fucking customer. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, yeah, I that that used to be a part of my shtick because I would quote jokes from comedians all the time, and it would floor people when I'd say all seven dirty words at once. And uh, But that was... I used to take broadcast media and that was actually a question on the final. I, I, I think that was uh, my teacher's joke. What are the seven dirty words you can't say on television? And so oh. we actually had to learn all seven. <laughs> and that sounds like a great professor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so um, as management stories go, you talk about uh, your uh, Karen problems Um you deal with that a lot on your, on your TikToks and just people um, just beating up basically on you just because you're the manager, you're the person to com- uh, complain to. And you said that you had a, had a thick skin, but well, were there times where they might have been a little close uh, or where you had to call the police or you were close to grabbing some of the cutlery behind you or something like that? <laughs> So there, um, especially when I was pregnant, because I was, I'm like I said, I'm yeah, that had to have been dangerous. A, a pregnant woman. <laughs> yeah, and like the lady I talk about on my TikTok, um, that was like calling every Sunday, mad as heck because she couldn't, um, she like put her name in on the wait list, and the wait list wasn't updated, and she knew this, so every time she got there, she'd have to wait like twenty or thirty minutes longer than the wait list had, had scripted to her, and I'm like. like you got to figure it out we've been doing this for four weeks and I remember one day um I walked back to the manager office because she had just she'd come it was you know like the fourth or fifth Sunday of the same crap and I walked back there and I said somebody better go get that stupid bitch before I stab her (laughs) like okay in the office you go um here's a glass of water why don't you chill out (laughs) and there was just so yeah I have a thick skin but I also have quite a bit of rage so like the stuff wouldn't like hurt my feelings, but it would piss me off. So I'd have mm. to like, and I, you know, back in the day, I, I was a little bit of a fighter. So, but you know, you have to leave that behind when you become a professional. And especially now that I have a, ch- a child, Sure. but um, no, I, mm. <laughs> <laughs> there've been a couple of occasions where I was just ready to let, just slap a little shit out of somebody. I was talking to an old employee today because I was, get, I'm trying to put together my next TikTok story. And, um, here's a preview for it, but, um, she, so what happened was this, I'm standing like, I don't know, like 10 feet from her, but I, I don't know if it's all service industry, but especially as a restaurant manager, you learn to not move and like, just like, like keep working, like keep typing in something on a screen, keep looking at something on a handheld or an iPad, but you can hear every singular thing, every singular conversation that's going on around you. So like I could hear my employee talking to this guest in the corner, the host talking to the guest at the host stand, and I could hear this interaction with her. And I, this lady came up to her and I, I hear her go, no, it gives me the shits. And my employee's like, well, you don't have to get hostile. And I heard her say that And this employee, she's one of the nicest women I've ever met, period. She's just adorable. All she does is like, be cute, work at a hospital and hang out with her wife. Like she's just this wholesome little creature. So I come around the corner and I was like, what's wrong? And this lady is going off and yelling at her because she offered her candy. Like she's supposed to. And she's like, it gives me the shits. And uh, my employee was like, well, it's sugar free. Cause she said it was because she was diabetic. And my employee was like, well, it's sugar free. And she's like, I don't give a fuck. Like, and whatever. And I'm like, Whoa, Whoa <laughs> you're not going to talk to her that way. You can just not come back. And her daughter was like, are you serious? And I was like, yeah, you're not going to talk to her that way. You're not going to cuss at her. And she's like, I wasn't cussing at her. I was saying that um, 
it gives me the shits. And I was like, if you're talking to her and saying the word shits in a hostile manner, you're cussing at her. So it's, you're done. You're not going to do it. If you do it again, you're leaving. And the daughter said something along the lines of, well, you're just a bitch, aren't you? And I was like, yep, get out of my store and don't come back. Mm. And she's like, are you serious? I'll call corporate. I was like, call him. Do you need me to spell my name? Here's my business card. That was my favorite petty move to do when somebody said they were going corporate. I was giving them a business card. <laughs> yeah. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> do you need my personal phone number too so that they can call my cell phone when I'm not at work? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, yeah. I uh, Yeah, I love those people that I'm going to talk to the owner. Or I I know the owner or uh, those those people. Uh, no, I know. And it's just like one, there were 750 restaurants. They weren't going to, they weren't going to bother. And two, like usually when a customer acted like that, the first thing I did after they left was go back and send my little email to HR so I can cover my own ass mm. and be like, Hey, this happened. They said, they're going to call you. Here you go. And then nothing ever comes of it, especially because I sent them that email first. Right. Like, go ahead and call them. <laughs> They're not going to fire me. <laughs> they don't fire. Like, that company, the only manager I ever knew that got fired was because he was, like, sleeping with a server <laughs> and got caught. And so they don't, they didn't fire people. So yeah. I wasn't worried about it. So nowadays, uh, you said that you're working for Fiverr? Yeah, so um, yeah, now, I'm a recruiter, and then I have uh, a fiber. Now you ha you'll have to tell me what that is. Uh, even though this is not a paid advertisement, uh, but you'll have to tell me what it, well, what exactly it is and what you do. So fiber is like a freelance website. Um, it's great for anybody who just wants to freelance anything. Like you can literally do anything on there. You can ghostwrite. Um, you can do digital designs for people. You can write eBooks for people, like anything that you think of that you can do as a service, um, you can put it on fiber and you can sell that service. Uh, obviously like accounting and stuff like that would be for an only friends account, but um, anything else that's not in an accounting position, you can put on fiber. Um, any like, pre like what I do is I, um, I have three on there. So I have, prepping for interviews where I will get on a zoom call with you. I'll go over all the questions that they would ask you the questions that you need to ask. I'll critique your responses so that you can have the best responses, tell you all the things about the company that you need to know going into the interview. I'll even help you pick out what to wear. <laughs> cool. <laughs> like, yeah. And then I, um, and then I also have two fun ones. One is just like a listening session. Like I'm not a coach or a therapist, but I've been through some shit. So like I put on there that like, I'll, if you, you know, you buy a service and I'll sit for 20, 30 or 60 minutes and I'll just listen to you rant or we can make fun of your ex or all that other fun stuff. Um, and then the last one I do is I'll call you and get you out of any social situation. Like if you're at a, <laughs> you're at a party and you no longer want to be at a party, then you just hop on there and get a hold of me and I'll, you know, for five bucks, I will call you and act like a relative and be like, no, there's an emergency. I need you to come home right now. Um, there was even a girl last week that asked me to call her boyfriend and break up with him for it. Luckily she changed her mind, but I was like, oh, okay. Oh I mean, my I God. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, oh, that's new. I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> so, uh, so are you allowed to, uh, uh, do you want to tell people how much you charge for these services? I kind of see the whole calling to get them out of a situation becoming very popular nowadays because, well, it was a couple episodes ago. I did uh, an episode called Angel Shot, which is a code word in bars and restaurants. If you are in a, on a first date and in a nasty situation or the guy's getting creepy or the girl's uh, getting weird, you can, uh, you can order an angel shot and the bartender will help you figure a way out. Like uh, you say you ordered an angel shot and the bartender will go behind the bar, disappear, come back, hand you a napkin and a cigarette. And you open up the napkin and it says, tell them you're going to go smoke this. The Uber is already waiting outside. So, like, I can see that you helping people get out of situations uh, becoming really popular in this day and age of Tinder dates and, uh, you know, online dating. That, uh, that would become really popular. <laughs> yeah, and I'm always, like, I mean, it could be even with family. Like, I definitely go into social situations, like... I have a cap. Uh, I just like you hit that social cap and then you're done for the evening. And sometimes it's, there's not always a good segue. Cause you know what, like with my best friend, like I'd tell her like, Hey, Latoya, like I don't, <laughs> I need to go home. And we're, we're comfortable enough to where we can both do that with each other. We just give each other this look like I'm ready for bed. Cause we both got to be in bed by 10 cause we can't do it. Mm. Um, but like, 
if I'm out with somebody that I've only gone out with a couple times or, you know, I'm with family and I don't want to be rude and hurt somebody's feelings, then I, it's just a great opportunity to be like, Hey, can you get me out of this please? (laughs) And Tinder dates, especially like if you're on a weird date, you gotta go. (laughs) And I will, I will 100% help somebody out and get them the heck out of a date because it's just so uncomfortable sometimes and you just don't know what to say and there's like obviously I never had a need for a tinder because I've been with my husband for almost eight years well, sure. no, over eight years yeah. and um I think that was even before tinder came out maybe not um but I never really needed that but I can imagine especially with tinder like you just meet somebody you've only talked to them a little bit um, and then you go out and you're like oh <laughs> <laughs> this is not where I wanted to be yeah so here to here to help a friend out uh that's um, that's brilliant if you ask me but thank you i appreciate that so yeah that's only um that's only five bucks for because the cheapest you can go on fiber is five bucks um that's only five bucks so i think there's an extra five dollar fee if like you need it like asap um because what i ask people to do is because you have to fill out questionnaires questionnaires when you get a service on fiber um and i have questions like who am i pretending to be what kind of emergency is like feasible for your life um, and stuff like that so that I can tell a lie that isn't like outlandish um, so that people around you will believe it if it's somebody you're close to. But um, I like to know like a day in advance and like what time and stuff that I need to be calling um, if they need it. But for an extra five bucks, I'll be on call and just do it whenever you need. And then the listening to event, it's like $15 for, um, Oh, it's ten dollars for twenty minutes, fifteen dollars for thirty, and then thirty dollars for uh, sixty minutes. And the fifteen dollar one, I was going to make. I think uh, I think I was going to make that one a little more, as like originally, but that one is um, essentially catered to moms. Like, if you just need thirty minutes to blow off some steam, because a lot of stay at home moms, like I work from home, and I know sometimes like. Uh, don't get me wrong I would never trade a minute with my daughter but sometimes I'm just like I've been talking to a baby all day oh (laughs) yes oh yes yeah Yeah, and you don't get any adult interaction so that one is really what that one's catered to but yeah 10 15 and 30 for event sessions and then the interview services it's like a full mock interview so um no that's very valuable I I like that idea and I've done 100 plus interviews and now um as a recruiter i just get i prep people for interviews all day long so you know i have plenty of professional history and getting people ready for interviews but that it's like you get what you get 30 minutes of my time for 25 bucks uh 60 minutes for 50 bucks and then 90 minutes for 75 and they all kind of step up and like how quickly you can get them and like all the things that i'll cover and like how in depth we'll go um so yeah, those are the prices for them, but I'm really excited about it. I just kind of got it started. I haven't been advertising a whole bunch, um, just cause I'm, I'm new to freelancing. Uh, so I don't know. I'm just excited, but, um, I wanted to say that if anybody that listens to this podcast, like once one of those services, if they message me on Fiverr, just the words, Hey bartender, I'll take off like 20% of their service fee. Oh, awesome. Uh, okay, people, you heard uh, you heard her. Uh, we'll, uh, I'll figure out a way to put the link uh, when I uh, post this show. And in fact, do you have a, do you have a link uh, that they can yeah, go to? Yeah, I can send it to you right after we get off the call. Cool. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll do the, all that and uh, so and you just mentioned Hey Bartender podcast or Hey Bartender whatever you decide to do and uh, uh, get uh, get money off it and get this invaluable help it sounds like. <laughs> Uh, Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I mean, I I can picture some of these mothers calling you up, saying, uh, screaming, "I'm so sick of Baby Shark," but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or Cocoa Melon or all of it. Yeah, <laughs> I got you, friend. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. Anyway, we're coming up on the end of the podcast. So um, so um, how? Uh, uh, why don't you tell everybody how they can reach you and uh, contact you if you uh, if they uh, if they want to or uh, advertise your social media? Go nuts, basically. Time, okay, time um, to promote yes. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so my TikTok and my Instagram. Um, my TikTok is definitely more fun than my Instagram. My Instagram, I just post like selfies and pictures of my baby because she's cute. Um, but my TikTok, mm-hmm. both handles are "Don't Come for Me." Okay, just the letters. Okay. Um, because don't come for me because I'll call you out on a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And then I don't really add people to my personal Facebook just because it just it gets to be a lot. Um, but you know, Twitter. I let me see what my I think my Twitter is also the same. Don't come for me, okay? Um, but that gets the least interaction. If you really want to see the magic happen and like restaurant stories and stories about Karens and all that other good stuff, definitely follow me on TikTok. Definitely, yeah. I've I've seen a lot of your stuff and. There were a couple of them that you got really, really passionate about the stories, and even I wanted to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, and it's funny because somebody the other day said that the stories would be shorter if I wasn't so dramatic, and I, you know, the next story I posted, I said, I am the fucking drama because I am. <laughs> like, I'm not going to not be dramatic because I, I, like, in regular life, am I dra- dramatic about everything? No. But when I'm telling a story, absolutely. I am super dramatic, and that's how it's going to stay. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's called entertainment. You know? I know. I know. You're here for the drama. <laughs> like, <laughs> not just going to read this monotone. Like, no. And, I, you know, like I have mentioned before, I have ADHD, and it's not medicated. So I'm just, like, all over the place of the story. So you get what you get. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, th- um. Stay on, uh, stay on the line. We're, you know, we're going to talk for a little bit, but uh, I just I want to thank you so much for being on the show, taking the time being on Hey Bartender podcast. You are awesome, uh, and uh, I'm uh, I'm sure people are going to love this. So uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. All right, people. It is last call. Last call for alcohol. Uh, let's do some thanks uh, first before we get out of here. Thank you so much for to Rachel Gollum for being on the show. You were absolutely awesome to talk to. Uh, and remember, guys, she is on Fiverr. Uh, and her the stuff that she's offering is sounds completely invaluable. So uh, this is the link on how to find her on Fiverr. Go to www.fiverr.com slash s2 slash db 74 b 37834 and remember when you contact her to uh mention hey bartender podcast and you get 20 percent off any of the stuff that you may ask her f- for help for the interview stuff getting you out of troubled situations she'll give you 20 percent off all you have to do is mention hey bartender podcast also special thanks to what we drinking uh drinking on instagram uh, whether you know it or not, I used your uh, drink as a drink special at the beginning of the show. Don't worry, I'll give you full credit for it. And finally, I got to thank to all the followers and listeners of this Hey Par- Bartender podcast. You guys are awesome. If uh, I didn't have you, I'd be talking to myself, which I do a lot anyway, so it would be no really big change. But remember, if you want to be a part of Hey Bartender podcast, all you have to do is email me, dude at heybartenderpodcast.com. And if you just want to share a story, you just you want to be on the show or you have a band that wants to get your sand out there, just let me know. Email me, dude, at heybartenderpodcast.com. You can also find me on social media. On Facebook, you will find me at Hey Bartender Podcast. Instagram at Hey Bartender Podcast. TikTok at Hey Bartender Podcast. You follow me around, you'll find out when the new episodes are coming up or if I just have something goofy to say. It, it happens. Uh, if you also want to get in a little bit deeper, go to www.heybartenderpodcast.com. There you can catch up on uh, past episodes of Hey Bartender Podcast and uh, pick yourself up a Hey Bartender Podcast t-shirt or other things that I got on sale there. Pick yourself up a t-shirt, help support a podcast. That's totally cool. Remember to share, like, and subscribe to Hey Bartender Podcast. Go to uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever you can, wherever you listen to Hey Bartender Podcast. Give me a rating, uh, leave a review. I would love to hear from all of you people. Let me know what you think of the show. But until next time, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. And as usual, I want to wish you all lots of love, lots of sex, lots of happiness, and don't take any shit from anyone. Good night. What do you mean it's last go? I just got here.